telling you that you know i'm such a big fan of talat mehmood i mean who isn't uh really that's so nice no it's nice to hear from a youngster that that's yeah. it's always very nice because uh, um uh, the youth is into different kind of music but uh, i've i've realized that somewhere people have kept him in a tiny place in their hearts <laughs> Certainly, certainly. I'm very old school, and uh, I love guzzles in particular. So, oh wow, there's no two ways about the fact that he's absolutely one of the most prominent and significant uh man men in you know guzzle singing. Right, the pioneer, wanna, actually, the first. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, I want to begin by asking you about you know how the idea for this book was conceived. Uh, I know it had something right. to do with Chashne Tala the concert. Uh, yes. but if you could tell us more well it started um with a very personal experience uh, see i i i grew up with uh, knowing him as my grand uncle and of course uh, uh, uh interacting with him as as family as uh, uh, a grand uncle and gramp who was very cute and sweet um and and realizing later what what an incredible legend uh, he was in his prime and um uh, this idea of course came to me much much uh, later when i was uh, uh, well into my profession after about 15 years of journalism and no one really knew and i never spoke about it at the workplace even though uh, i had uh, my friends who were into bollywood reporting and sometimes speaking to the golden era people like lata didi and yusuf saab dilip kumar ji and all but i never spoke about it i don't know why i i just thought that i'm i'm here to do my job and establish my journalism and i'm not going to be uh, speaking about a legacy that people feel that i just want to you know piggy back on i, I wasn't doing that uh, but when the idea of jashn talat came to me um on one such day while i was driving to work and i had just rejoined work after having a baby and uh, my bulletins were booked and i was driving to my new studio and uh, my my baby wasn't well but i had to leave him behind and you know go to the studio <laughs> and um i was feeling miserable and i just I, i was driving to work and i put on my radio at the car and uh, he was singing one of his songs i mean the radio plays his songs very often and uh, I, i think it was uh, shame gham that was playing and uh, one was always very aware of the soothing quality of his voice the soft gentle velvety touch you know uh, and one had heard it so many times and uh, thought about it and said yes of course it's one of the most uh, magnificent unique voices but it was the first time i personally experienced <laughs> the calming effect of his voice and i just felt so grateful and i said oh my god this beautiful voice is at home and uh, uh, and he's uh, he's comforting me in one of my most miserable moments and i'm uh, i'm so proud that uh, i'm i'm connected to him and i'm related to him and i just felt immense gratitude and i i felt i needed to uh, give back to his legacy and do something about it so that's when i started talking about it because i wanted to do a, a, a tribute concert and and design the tribute concert in a manner which is uh, reaching out to the youth doing college festivals of his songs having the youth uh, participate in singing competitions of only singing his songs and then uh making it multi performance as well we did a flash mob with youngsters uh, with his peppy numbers at uh, uh, inside a mall inside the dlf mall and uh, then brought in kathak artists and modern singers and portrait artists and uh, bollywood salsa dancers as well so um i, I curated a festival which was about uh, rediscovering him and you know uh, telling the youth about him Uh, about uh, what a unique pioneering uh, iconic artist he was 
Um, and that uh, also got me on to uh, a journey of uh, doing research on his career. Uh, I knew a bit. Uh, sometimes I knew a lot, sometimes I knew a bit, but the more I read about him, the more I realized and discovered I was uh, uh, truly as a journalist, very intrigued, you know, um, very curious about his journey because there were so many pioneering aspects to his life. Um, the way he decided to uh, be a singer in, in the early 1930s when he was a young boy, it was about stepping out of a cultural uh, household, which was very cultural, but very conservative as well. Uh, which uh, which appreciated the arts and was very culturally engaged in poetry and music and ghazals. Uh, but it drew a line as far as commercially earning from uh, the profession was concerned. In those days, you could not be commercially earning from the arts. It was it was okay that you promoted the arts and you called these artists home and had mehfils and betaks, but not become commercially engaged yourself. So uh, there were a few battles to fight and then he shifted to Kolkata because that is where the showbiz was. Then he shifted to Bombay, established one of the pillars of establishing the golden era music, uh, being a pioneer in establishing the non-film independent ghazal industry. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it may seem like a very big statement, but actually uh, in, in independent India after independence, he's the one uh, who ended up establishing the commercial viability of the non-film ghazal music industry. And, and listening to him and looking at his uh, phenomenal success, uh, there were gen uh, legends of the next generation, such as Mehdi Hassan Saab, Jagjit Singh Ji, uh, who primarily decided to become ghazal singers only because of Talat Mahmood. So there were so many pioneering aspects uh, and the way he started um, international concert tours. He was the first playback singer from India who started world tours very early in 1956. And that's when his colleagues, uh, his friends, Mukesh Ji and Lata Didi, uh, decided to start their own tours. So he was literally building a map for all his colleagues to across the world where, you know, uh, Hindi film music concerts would be in demand. Uh, to encapsulate what I'm trying to say is that um, the more I found out about him, I realized not everything can be put into that concert. This really needs a book. So uh, the concert series led me to the book. So right, right. that's how it started. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. Um, what I do want to ask you is that, uh, you know, you're a journalist, you know how important objectivity is uh, in nonfiction. Yeah. Uh, but being his niece, uh, was there some sort of bias that you had to navigate, which was tricky? Uh, because there is a personal sense of bias that can encroach the space. Right. No, I'm very glad you asked me that. Um, uh, I would obviously always say that. Uh, um, uh, and that's the reason I call it the definitive biography, that it's the it's the purest and most truthful insight and an exclusive insight to his life. A lot of aspects that people have not known about. Um um, so, so there were conversations at home and with my family um, that um, I, I had to uh, dig in certain aspects. Of course, we all spoke about, spoke a lot about his success and about his achievements and all. Uh, but personal things such as um, the decision to leave home and um, have this um, uh, argument with his father and then have his father come around and finally accept his choice of profession or his decision to uh, marry out of his own choice. Once again, I say that it was a very uh, conservative, uh, cultural, educated, yet conservative uh, Muslim family background. Uh, getting married outside that cultural radius was uh, not encouraged. So he took that decision for his personal life as well. Um, so um, somehow I was very aware of... Uh, not letting that bias creep. And I think I've written the book uh, to, to a larger extent in being very truthful to my journalism. And uh, like, I've, I've been a journalist now for about uh, 22 years. And it's, 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 uh, it's such second nature to, to, to be seeking the truth in every, every story that you pick up. So uh, this was like a very big story and, uh, and uh, a personal story as well. Uh, but I was uh, all the time very conscious to be uh, true to my journalism, to to bring out everything as much as possible objectively, you know. Otherwise, um, otherwise, there's no point in in writing a book and calling it a definitive biography. If you're bringing out a story, and if uh, if in, in in your career as a journalist you've always been true to facts, there's no point in bringing out 
the the largest story of your life that you're writing and not be true to facts. I I couldn't have cheated myself as a journalist. I I, I couldn't. Right, right, absolutely. I think that's that's that that is what makes a biography what it is. Uh, right. You br- you bring in everything. I mean, no matter how sweet and how successful and how mm-hmm. perfect a person is, there is always the black and white and the gray, and you yeah. you bring in all those shades. You know. Right, right. Uh, I went through the e copy of the book and. Uh, one of the one of the key takeaways that I had from the book was how you've highlighted sec his secularistic uh, beliefs and uh, his patriotism uh, throughout mm-hmm. the biography. Uh, I I want to ask you: Was there a reason that you know you put so much emphasis on it? Uh, was there a reason mm-hmm. that uh, was it something you were particularly fond of, or was it that was that that important in his life? Um. I think the trigger was um, the, the politics of today. Uh, yeah. There is uh, a certain politics of today which leans towards being um, uh, anti-minority or, or is very accusatory uh, in saying that uh, you shouldn't have stayed back in the country after independence. So um, I, I don't think he had that trigger in his life. It was a trigger in my life, um, which I felt uh, had to be put across in this book as a statement as well, with respect to having an insight on uh, the kind of decisions that families of those time took, the kind of decision that Muslim families of the time took in staying back in India, in supporting India's secularism and not going to Pakistan. So that's why I've uh, um, I've put in a whole chapter which, which is about independence and partition and what was going through uh, around in neighborhoods, in lives, in families, uh, how you experienced it personally, members of your family leaving. Uh, there was so much chaos and yet you stood ground in uh, that one belief that you had in, in the secular fabric of India. So, and uh, there was also an article, um, I remember that uh, it, it was an opinion piece that was written and it went online and someone uh, shared a screenshot of that uh, and sent it to me saying that, uh, and this person has uh, um, is writing a column in a very prominent uh, newspaper. And uh, he, he says that uh, Talat Mahmood also left and went to Pakistan. <laughs> so I was absolutely appalled because Talat Mahmood is someone who's a Padma Bhushan. He's someone who the government of India has um, honored in so many ways, released a commemorative, commemorative stamp on his name. He's someone so so famous that I, I think that it's impossible to have any confusion in people's minds. And yet there is this um, parallel narrative which does cause confusion. And it's, it's, it's a post-truth world after all. And I remember I had to call up that publication and say that I'm absolutely appalled. How could this just go online unchecked and, and please pull it down or please edit it? Um, so I'm I'm glad I was in that position to do that. But I, I I I would always just wonder what if I couldn't, you know, once a piece goes online, it just stays there and and, and the longer it stays and people just start believing in it. Um so uh, those were the underlying thoughts uh in, in which perhaps why you felt that I've put it out so prominently. I think uh, uh sometimes uh when things go unspoken, there's a lot of misunderstanding. It's really to it's really important, especially nowadays, to, to, to put it right uh, and to put it out that obviously that uh, uh, this is what the family was and this is the decision that was taken very consciously, you know. Yeah, no, I found it very interesting and I'm quite glad that you didn't try to paint an apolitical picture because nothing really is uh, apolitical. Uh, but but uh, yeah, uh, I, what I do, what I'm very curious to know about is uh, when you're writing about family, uh, I'm mm-hmm. sure it's it's easy because you have access, but is it also quite difficult? Uh, because you're writing about somebody whom you love and whom you quite you you're very close to. Um, mm-hmm. is that tricky? Is that a tricky ground? Uh, it is tricky, but it's uh, you have to consciously uh, revisit it and go through it and. Uh, revisit your purpose of writing this book, biography, Uh, revisit uh, what it means to his music fans, music lovers, Uh, revisit what it means for uh, his stature in the film industry or the music industry, Um, revisit what it means for your family. And 
uh, while uh, uh, a major part of my family is very proud and glad that they've written it, there, there, there are one or two people who are not very happy. Uh, but um, I, I think this was a story worth telling, you know, and in 100 years of his birth, this is his birth centenary that we're looking at. Um, I think it's high time people knew the uh, iconic life that he lived. It's, it's a story that is worth telling over and over again. And I say that now that the biography is out, uh, I'm looking at a biopic. So I'm, I'm not stop, stopping here. I'm looking at the next step uh, because it's... Uh, um, I very strongly feel about it as an example worth emulating, you know, I mean, in every aspect, whether it's in his arts, whether it's about uh, promoting the arts to the outside world, uh, where it's about standing up for your rights. He was the, uh, he was the, when he was the secretary of the Playback, Playback Singers Association, um, uh, he, he was uh, in his official capacity, he took a very big step in, um, uh, uh, raising the issue of royalty for singers. And he did that in um, um, in the 1960s. He did that. He did that uh, back in the day. And that is where uh, the industry had a three-month mic down protest. There were no recordings that took place for three months. So that was really the first big step. So he's, he's done... Um, he's led his life really building these uh, examples worth emulating. And... Um, I, I remember speaking to uh, another young journalist about this, just like you. And uh, it was very interesting to uh, see his response and reaction to the book as well. He said that uh, he could immediately relate to these issues because um, a, a lot of the things that he did um, or, or showcased uh, by, through his gestures and actions are also uh, examples that one can relate to today. Yeah. So I... I I don't think that I'm talking about history. I feel that I'm talking about something which is relevant today. Certainly. I mean, uh, I read about his activism and his politics and all of that is more than relevant today. It's, it's history repeating itself. And I think he stands mm -hmm. as an example of what we can do uh, right. to change it. Uh, what I do want to ask you is that uh, after writing this book, do you personally feel closer to him than you did before uh, he wrote it? That's such a beautiful question. It's uh, it speaks of your sensitive mind. I mean, uh, that's very very uh, uh, in uh, thoughtful. I think you know, and uh, I, uh, I I did feel um, I, I felt uh, there were times when I was stuck in the book. Um, I felt that he was just. Uh, he just surrounded me. He didn't let me get out of that cloud, you know, and he just kept saying, try a bit harder, try a bit harder. It will happen, you know, just do it. So I, I used to have these conversations with him in my head, which I didn't when he was alive, because when he passed away, I was uh, I, I was getting into college. I had just passed out of school and uh, I was getting into college. And that was the time when he, he, he passed away. So I, I couldn't really have these conversations. Uh, conversations as an adult with him and uh, more importantly I couldn't speak to him as a journalist so that just remains my biggest regret you know that as a journalist I could never speak with him and uh, I uh, like it took me um, about one and a half year of uh, research and writing in of this book and I think for all those months he just stayed with me and uh, I uh, I feel that I understand him much more closely uh, because I've revisited him and his life so much in my head um, that I feel I understand him more closely than people who knew him in his lifetime, you know? And um, I don't know at, at which level that we've had these conversations. Yeah, so I do feel very close to him. <laughs> I think that's, that's beautiful. And that's what, you know, I think literature does to you. But, right. Uh, what are your hopes for the book? I mean, apart from the fact that people will love it and appreciate it, uh, do you have any particular that you hope that the book can achieve? Well, for every um, author, it's of course uh, hoping that it becomes a bestseller. Uh, but uh, um, and uh, in 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 by by saying that it becomes a bestseller, I'm not looking at a, a commercial value. I'm not attaching a commercial value because writing this has been like a uh, like a very uh, like an act of dedication to his legacy it, it 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 really wasn't done for anything else but just 
being dedicated to telling his story. Uh, when I say that uh, I wanted to be a bestseller, it's more in terms of wanting it to reach out to as many people as possible, wanting uh, as many people to read his story. I mean, uh, if you're listening to his songs today, it's great. But if also reading his story, I think that will be fabulous. So in that sense, I hope it becomes a, a bestseller. And, and, and I think uh, the icing on the cake will be when when it really becomes a biopic, if it becomes a biopic, because uh, it's um, it, it's it, it was a challenging life, and he led it with a lot of style and uh, with a lot of uh, genteel uh, passion, and um, uh, it makes for a biopic as well. So uh, I hope it becomes a biopic. <laughs> I hope so because uh, I'm an entertainment <laughs> journalist first, so I will have to go watch it. Uh, cool. but, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I think the book in many ways uh, we've heard his songs for so long, and uh, the book kind of gives you a backstory to what you to the man you're listening every day, and uh, I think that's just that's just, just fan fabulous. And uh, I think my last question. But uh, did you uh, did you feel it? If I can, sorry, I'm 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 so used to being the journalist here that I have to ask a question. <laughs> Um, did, did you feel that um, his presence is around as um, um, as a life which is current while reading it as a life that you can relate to or, or did you feel the baggage of history like it's a Absolutely. it's a slice of history that I'm going to read and oh, oh god I hope it's not going to be a boring history chapter I my, my idea was to uh, put it across uh, as uh, lightly and relatable and as chatty as uh, possible um, in giving out his story. Right, right. No, I, absolutely. Uh, not for a moment did I feel disconnected or did I feel that, oh. you know, this is something from the past. Uh, okay. Probably because what he did, I what have you, what you've written of him in his lifetime mm -hmm. is so relatable. It, it is so, in, in the larger scheme of things. Um, okay. It is so relevant that you know there are parts like especially the playback singing strike and everything mm -hmm. and, and you hear singers yeah. even today speak about it i think arman malik uh spoke about it recently about right that. right and also version songs and all of that so yeah, yeah i mean that's that's still happening a lot in the industry but yeah, yeah. So, and even more than that what i felt was that you, you listen to this man every day i listen to it while i'm driving to work i listen to him uh when i'm feeling wow. down and uh and they become a part of your life in a way that you cannot, uh, make, in a way that you cannot explain. But uh, mm -hmm. being there, they've, they've, they've been there when you're crying, they've been there when you're, you know, when you're having a happy time with your family. And then you get to know right, them. Right. And especially with him, I don't think right. we knew a lot about him uh, as compared yeah, to true. other singers. And yeah. just really knowing him. And I think when you hear him now, it's, co it's a completely different experience altogether. Uh, it's a wow. wonderful experience. Okay. So I absolutely thank you. love it. And um, thank you. I can't wait to see what it does uh, when it's released. Okay. Uh, my last question is actually, uh, how did you research for the book? Because I, I when I read it, I, it's, it's a lot of material. It's a lot that has go, uh, gone in. Yeah. And yeah. So I'd love to know how you researched about it. Um, uh, well, First point, of course, was family with uh, my mom, my uncles, and um, and um, uh, the second, of course, was his colleagues. Now, the thing was that I, I wrote this book uh, so late in the day that his his colleagues and his friends passed away, be it uh, Lata Didi, be it uh, Dilip Kumar Saab, uh, or uh, uh, other of his friends, Mukesh Ji, and uh, other of his people in the film industry that he was close to, or in the ghazal industry. Uh, so many had passed away, but I was, um, but um, I, I was fortunate to get in touch with people uh, who gave me a fresh new uh, perspective or details in that part of his career that was not spoken about much which which i'm particularly looking at his concert years you know when in in the late 60s when he started touring all when his recordings were coming down and he started uh, touring every month and mostly for most part of the year he was outside um his film career and his songs recordings and all is anyway spoken about a lot i got insights from family about his growing up years and his years of 
moving to Kolkata and then settling in Bombay. The golden era success years, of course, have already been spoken about much. There was already so much out there that I had to just put together. Um, but post that, in the late 1960s, when he uh, was uh, touring much more often, uh, that was a time that no one talks about or no one knew. And I was very fortunate that I got in touch with people who were still around, who were part of that concert period uh, from the late 1960s up to the 90s. And, and these are people who are very old and they're 91, 92 years old himself. One, they were part of his troupe. One was his accordionist and musician. The other was his concert manager. And uh, they shared such fabulous details that even my family didn't know about because when they were touring, he wouldn't come back home and give all these details. So they had these such exclusive insights. Um, I was I was very lucky I could, uh, that became part of my research. I, I found them, I got their names. Uh, uh, even someone like uh, of, of later times, uh, Kavita Krishnamurti ji, uh, she's mentioned in the book because she started her career uh, in her singing, professional singing career uh, with these concerts that she did with uh, Talat Nana, that she did with uh, Manna Desa. Uh, she gave me such inside details. His concert manager uh, told me about uh, what absolutely mass hysteria and frenzy uh, used to be uh, when he would um, uh, when, when he would go out for these concerts. So for me, that is a very interesting, fascinating part from the 1960s onwards where he's outside. Um, and uh, quite literally, it was like a Talat mania, you know, because the police had to be called in and control the mobs. Uh, trains would be stopped midway because people would be annoyed that he's not performing in their city. So all these incidents were really fresh. And um, I'm, I just feel so glad that uh, they're still around and I could speak to them. And uh, I... I, I managed to, you know, I mean, squeeze it down and do it pretty fast in that sense. So I'm, I'm, I'm really just, I think, fortunate about that. Yeah. I think that's that's very interesting. And I know I said this was the last question, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I really want to know, like, what should we expect? Should we expect another book from you about him, not about him, something else? Um, what's next? What's next for me, per se? Or what's next? If you ask me what's next for the book, of course, I, I want the book to be a biopic now. I'm <laughs> being very <laughs> greedy about that. Uh, what's next for me, per se, uh, professionally, while I I, 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 stopped, I stepped away from my television news studio in this brief uh, one and a half, two years to write the book. Um, and uh, I, I would... Uh, I either go back, of course, to to the news and um, or, or be doing that parallel to being an author. This is the first time I'm having an experience of being an author. And uh, it's it's like a new avatar for me right now. I, I'm not used to be in used to being introduced as Seher Zama, the author. It's, it's always been Seher Zama, the journalist um, or or the art curator for the other projects that I do. Uh, but um, uh, the the, the being called an author is a very new sound. It, it, it has a very new sound and ring to it in my head. And uh, uh, maybe I could write another book, but it has to be something that I feel very strongly about. Uh, this story was something I felt very strongly about. So um, I got down to writing it. But yeah, I mean, um, I, I liked writing because, you know, uh, when... Um, uh, as a television journalist, you don't write much. I had my regular columns in print media. I would write about politics, I write about arts, uh, but those were columns that you write. Uh, writing a book is a whole different deal. So um, uh, I've, I've enjoyed that as well. I've enjoyed that process. Uh, and I, I, I could stay on with it perhaps, yeah. I, don't know. I think we can't wait to see more of what you do. And thank you so oh, much for speaking to me. Uh, I love the book, like I said, and I can't wait for people to see it. Uh, thank you, thank, thank you. you. It's it's already out as an ebook. Yes, and yeah. um, it's it's available online as an ebook. And uh, but uh, because um, I thought the ebook is really convenient, you know, I put in a lot of pictures. Uh, these were uh, family pictures, ex some very very special exclusive pictures from family albums and studios that uh, I, I got cleaned up, digitally cleaned up, and uploaded as part of the ebook. Uh, but there's so many of his fans. Um, 
uh, who are in touch with me and who knew that I've been in this process of writing the book, they've been really waiting for the print version. So um, I'm, I'm going to be out with a print version to mark his uh, anniversary, which is in February. Uh, that would be the date of the centenary. So um, the, the ebook is out for guys, for people who are comfortable with that media. Uh, but the print version will also most certainly be out in the coming, I think, two, three weeks now. Yeah. Right, right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was lovely speaking to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best to you. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.